Excellent. So I think I'm going to go ahead and, and start us. Welcome to the webinar, everyone. We already have 73 attendees. We're so excited about this. Uh, my name is Miss D. Wright. I'm a professor in the kinesiology department at Cal State East Bay. I'm also the co-director for the Center for Sport and Social Justice here. And I've got a lovely group of people that I've been working with, and I'll introduce them shortly. Uh, we are here today for the webinar entitled Getting and Keeping K-12 Girls in Sports and Physical Activity. Again, that QR code will take you to a two-page uh, top 10 list based on a, a, an exhaustive lit review that we did, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started here. Welcome in. Uh, I, we've got plenty of people in the room, and we're going to hear a little bit more about that. But I'm really excited to be here with this group, um, being involved with the Center of, Sport for, Center of Sport and Social Justice for the last eight to 10 years. One of our missions really is to engage students in community outreach and research projects and also serve as a hub and resource for community groups and organizations. So I'm really excited about this project and how it's really living up the mission of the center and partnering with organizations uh, such as Positive Coach, Alliance, um, Positive Coach and also Soccer Without Borders, uh, just to name a few here. So our agenda for today, Introductions, uh, see who's here, not just us as panelists, but attendees, we'd love to learn more. I'll turn it over to Kim after that. And Kim's gonna talk a little bit about the research behind this. So really our webinar is broken up into two different parts. We're gonna talk a little bit about some background information with the research, and then hopefully spend a lot of time with our uh, wonderful panelists that we have for you all and just really see how this research translates into practice. And then hopefully leave about 10 minutes for questions and wrap up. So introductions, I'm going to have a poll open up right now. And with this poll, we would love to see who's in the room, right? We know that oftentimes we wear different hats. And so with this poll, you're going to see um, you might be a coach, you might be an athlete or a parent or guardian. And, and if you can, you can check more than one box. Um, that just gives us a good idea of who's joining us today and and maybe what you can take away from this. And it also helps us sort of guide the conversation a little bit too. Excellent, great, lots of responses coming in. A lot of youth sport administrator, we saw that as we were going through the RSVP list. Um, people even from out in Baltimore, across the country, uh, up in Canada, I saw a few from uh, Paris. So welcome to our French people. And uh, yeah, wow, a really nice spread of people. Excellent, thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and end poll. And we can share those results. And I'll go ahead to our next screen. And so, yeah, we can see, yeah, really nice mix of people. Great, thanks for completing that, everyone. So introductions, I've already introduced myself, Professor Missy Wright here at Cal State East Bay. Um, the reason that I wanna introduce this, this is our research team. So this webinar is based from the work that we conducted over the last eight months or so uh, with Title IX celebrating its 50th anniversary. Kim Turner from Positive Coaching Alliance reached out to us and said, I think we have something that we can do. Can we pull something together with people from the Center for Sport and Social Justice, Claire at St. Mary's, um, we have Sarah, uh, St. Mary's College, a librarian. If you ever have a chance to do a lit review with a librarian, do not turn that down. She was such a wonderful resource for us. Uh, Kayla Soto, a student intern who worked with us. So again, just really living out our mission uh, for the center with getting our students involved, uh, working with the community organizations, and hopefully getting a really powerful piece out in the field. And that's really what this webinar is, is how can we get this um, two-pager top 10 recommendation list of getting and keeping girls involved in sport? How can we get this coming to life more and more? So that's a little bit of introduction. What about our panelists? We have some just tremendous panelists here. Uh, Dania Cabello, an athlete, artist, and educator, and we're going to do more introductions in depth in a little bit. Uh, we've worked with Dania a few times, and I always jump at the opportunity of having Dania in our conversations uh, with the center. Uh, same with Christina. Christina is, uh, wears two hats here. She was part of our research team and also is a coach, so it'll be great to hear from her. Lastly, we have Carl Cooper, um, who I've just met in the last week, and it's been great to hear some of Carl's stories already, Deputy, Deputy Director from LA County Parks and Recreation. Uh, so with that, that's who's in the room. That's a little bit of introduction. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Kim Turner uh, to take it away from here. Thank you so much, Missy. So much, Missy. 
Hi, everyone. Great to have you here. We're so thrilled. Uh, thank you so much for your interest in gender equity in youth sports. We're going to talk a little bit about why gender equity, the literature review itself, the top 10 list, which is so exciting and so special and really unprecedented. Talk a bit about the progress we've made in girls in sport and what work we have left to do, and then talk about the top 10 tips. So if we can go to our next slide, we're going to give you a bit of information about why this topic is so important. And I just want to say, I know we have a lot of folks on the call on the webinar uh, who we know and folks that we haven't yet met. And I think this gender equity and youth sports movement is just getting bigger and bigger. Um, and I'm so grateful to have you as a teammate on the call today. I also just want to add, as we talked about what hat we're wearing, what, what role we play, that I am lucky to wear a lot of hats myself. Uh, with the Positive Coaching Alliance Gender Equity Initiative, I'm also a Title IX attorney for the last decade. I'm a mom to a boy and a girl who love sports. I'm a coach of kids, and I also am an advocate. Uh, so I'm trying constantly to wear those different hats and bring together people in different disciplines to get more girls in the game. So in terms of why this topic matters, now some of these folks on the webinar today are gonna know these stats, and some might not know, and often we have to kind of stop for a second and say, why does it matter? Why does girls in sports, uh, is it something that we need to focus on? So health-wise, education-wise, and career-wise, we know that getting girls in the game and keeping them in the game means more health education and career success. So for example, girls who played sports growing up have better mental and physical health. That includes things like lower rates of depression and breast cancer as adults. Um, education. We know that girls who play sports growing up actually graduate at higher rates and they pull their GPA up and they go to class more and they're more engaged in their educational context if they've joined a team, if they're part of a sport program. We know also that there are career dividends, but there's more and more research every day about this. And here's my favorite fact of the day in terms of why girls in sports matters. So girls who play sports in high school have been found to make 7% higher wages, 7 to 8% higher wages as adults. So I like to say sports and girls isn't just about fun and games, it's about dollars and cents. So we need to make sure girls have those open doors to play. Now, the literature review itself, as Missy said, we were lucky to get together, myself and several professors, researchers, librarians, and other stakeholders and say, is there a list of what gets and keeps girls in the game? And no, there isn't quite yet, before this literature review, a top 10 list of what works. And I just want to flag for those folks on the call, a lot of you are coaches, a lot of you are youth sport administrators. How many folks out there have tons of time, tons of extra resources, tons of staff? No, all of us are working with less, and we need to be creative with the resources we have. Y'all are amazing superheroes getting kids into sports, coaching, planning programs, but you don't always have a lot of time and resources to try new things. So part of the literature review that really excites me is to give you a list that's in regular language. It's not too academic. It's not too dense. It's not too complicated. In just two pages, what are the tips that get and keep girls in the game? And it's evidence-backed. So we know the research says this works. So you don't have to experiment and try lots of new things that might not pay dividends. So I'm very excited to share the top 10 tips with you after we just quickly do a check on the progress we've made. So many of you have celebrated the Title IX 50th in the last couple of months. June uh, 2022, last year was our Title IX 50th anniversary. We were so pleased um, to celebrate five decades of the law. And we know that in 1972, when Title IX was passed, there were about 300,000 girls playing high school sports. And today we have over 3 million girls playing sports in high school. So we know we've made progress, but we still have many, many more girls that wanna play and aren't yet in the game. And they also wanna play on an equal basis. So making sure that they have all the trappings of a good sports experience. And we also know that we have a lot of great youth coaches out there, but only about 25% are women and not enough women of color are in the ranks of youth coaches. So we need more, and we wanna make sure that we're recruiting, retaining, and supporting more women coaches. Finally, I just wanna flag that we know we've made progress, but we really need to focus on low-income communities and girls of color who have not yet gotten the full promise of Title IX in their communities, equity, and opportunity. 
So a lot of my work at Positive Coaching Alliance and the work of this group is about how to get those girls in the game for a lifetime of success. So now I wanna to turn to our top 10 list. Um, so I do get excited. People know I'm very enthusiastic about this work, uh, but I love that this is an easy, digestible list that anyone, no matter their hat, coach, youth sport administrator, athletic director, middle school administrator, high school, big high school athletic director, anyone can use this list. Okay, so I'm going to rattle off the top 10, and then we're going to talk to our featured guests about how they bring this work into practice each day. So number one, promoting girl-only and or girl-centered programming. This is something that is so important that not everyone realizes. Um, many folks recognize, for example, in a park and rec context, that there's co-ed youth sports. And we'll say, yeah, we have co-ed program, anyone's welcome, but we sometimes see just five or 10% girls on the teams and in the league. So we know from the research that having a girl only option or more girl centered programming can mean girls get and stay in the game. Um, and I played co-ed sports growing up. I know a lot of girls do like that environment, but we have to kind of sometimes step back and think, is this working for girls and try to offer different options. Number two, ask girls what they want. It's not rocket science. It's not so surprising, but making sure that girls input is part of the equation is critical. So one example from a wonderful park and rec agency is doing some surveying. Could be a focus group, it could be a simple Google survey, but you wanna survey the girls and say, what's working for you and what could be different or better? And so one park and rec surveyed girls and found out that girls just wanted to play on a team with one girl that they know. A buddy registration system would make all the difference for girls trying a new sport or a new league. So lots of low to no cost options that come out of asking girls what they want. And also sport selection. Don't presume that girls want to play the same sports that boys want to play. So I've seen surveys where volleyball or wrestling or tumbling or swim or track and field are popular among girls. And we want to make sure that we're not presuming that we're offering all the same sports to all the same constituencies. We want to tailor to them. Number three, develop skills, then introduce healthy competition. Now, I know we have a lot of sports folks on this webinar. I'm a competitive person. I played college volleyball. But we also have to step back and remember that kids that are new to a sport often need to build confidence and skills in their sport practice and then introduce competition when they're ready. So I've seen some very successful youth uh, girls basketball leagues where they might not keep score right away. They might make sure girls feel comfortable with the rules and those fundamental skills before they then start keeping score. Lots of ways that we can make sure girls get that chance to be competitive, but also the, the building blocks of the sport. Number four, emphasizing social support from family and friends. And again, just want to flag, these tips were distilled from 150 plus studies from incredible researchers across the country over many years. So Kim Turner might be talking about X, Y, or Z, but this is what the research says. Um, so emphasizing social support can mean things like connecting with the family member of the girl. And, you know, I've heard great stories about this where maybe you're a coach with a busy team, you're trying to you know, herd the cats of 15, 30 kids on a team and mom shows up to practice that day. Jogging over to mom or grandma or the guardian that brought the girl to, to the sport and say, thanks for bringing her today. She's doing great. We're so glad you're part of this team. Making sure you're connecting with the family and friends around the girl so that she has the scaffolding of support to stay in the game is critical. And then of course, celebrating girls in the community on their teams and in their leagues. Number five, supporting women coaches. Again, it's, it sounds simple, but it's so important. So making sure that women that are coaching in your league or your program are getting support and affirmation and making sure you're recruiting and retaining women coaches. So things like working with women coaches schedules, making sure that if a woman wants to coach in your program, you work around her work schedule best you can because we want her out there. That's huge. So we'll go on to our last couple of tips. Number six. I know y'all are getting really excited about these tips as we go, and we are going to hear real life stories from Danya, Carl, and Christina about these tips. So training all coaches how to coach girls. This is what the research showed. We need to just, of course, train coaches, and thankfully, Positive Coaching Alliance has wonderful workshops and training tools that anyone can benefit from. So please check out our website, but specifically how to coach girls. So another example on that one is I just had a wonderful conversation with a boys tackle football coach the other day who said there are some specific ways when he coaches girls flag football that he pivots. He doesn't assume that he's going to coach exactly the same way when he works with a girls team. Now, nobody 
is a one size fits all. We want to make sure to meet kids where they're at, make sure that they feel good about coaching approaches. But girls can be coached in really informed ways and really smart, empathetic ways that work for girls. So let's make sure to train coaches how to coach girls. Number seven, uniform accessibility. I don't know if you've ever tried on athletic apparel that didn't fit right, but I know that I'm way more inclined to play and practice a sport if you're wearing something that fits you, that feels good, that's tailored to you. So we need to make sure the research shows girls wearing uniforms that are accessible, comfortable, and they fit right makes a difference. Number eight, designing culturally responsive programs. So the research again shows making sure your program is culturally responsive is a key to get and keep girls in the game. So another example I've seen in my work is a youth sports group translated its flyers into Spanish and Chinese so that they could reach groups of girls that hadn't previously played the sport. So making sure that you're culturally sensitive in your offerings and making sure to connect with different swaths of your community. Number nine, creating accessible opportunities. So transportation, cost, Anything accessibility wise is gonna make a difference. I know many parents of girls, guardians of girls that are saying, is it a safe location to practice and play? Are there bathrooms that are um, clean and accessible? Uh, is there lighting? Is there a bus that we can take to get to that game or practice? So just considering accessibility is huge. And then finally, adding intentional girl-centered policies and procedures. So examples of that might be historic use permitting. So if you're a park and rec agency, or a school that's typically given court or field space to the last user, if a girl's team is saying, hey, we'd like to try to get into that gym, think about historic permitting use uh, as a way to, to change the game. If you make a more neutral policy where anyone can buy for that gym or that field, you may get newcomers like a new girls team or league. And that's a great way to be girl-centered in your policies. All right, I went fast through it. You can read it on your own time. You have the two-pager. We'll talk more about it in a second, but I want to take a poll now. Which tips that I've gone through are interesting to you? Which would be something that you'd like to try in your youth sport programming? And um, we're going to ask our amazing tech people at Cal State to run the poll. So feel free. Of course, you can choose them all if you want. But why don't you select the ones that interest you? And uh, also, I just want to flag that this is an ongoing dialogue. So we're talking today, but we look forward to lots of ways to engage about the tips into the future. So it's one hour today and a lifetime of commitment to gender equity that are gonna change the games for girls. So we're just getting a couple more inputs on this poll, thank you so much. And then in about 10 seconds, we'll close the poll and we'll hear from folks on what tips interest you. And do please read the two pager because it unpacks even further those top 10 tips in the research. And, and we really worked hard to write it in a way that can make sense to anyone. Oh my gosh, look at all this great interest. So I'm seeing, let's see, uh, asking girls what they want, very high up there, training all coaches how to coach girls, terrific, really great interest, frankly, in all the tips. I'm really, really happy to see that. And I also want to flag that y'all are the experts too. So folks out there that are on this webinar, feel free to chat in your own experiences. How have you worked to implement these tips? How have you seen them work in your program? Because we know we're amongst experts um, out in the world on this webinar who have a lot to share as well. All right, so now that we've gone over the tips um, and we've done our poll, I'm gonna pass it to Claire Williams, who's gonna share more about our incredible featured guests and their background, and then we'll hear from them on how they're bringing these tips to life in their program. Over to you, Claire, thanks. Thanks, Kim. Thank you for that uh, overview. I'm Claire Williams. I'm a professor at St. Mary's College of California and a member of the research team. It is now my pleasure to introduce our guest speakers uh, in order to pivot our conversation from the tips uh, we identified through our research to their actual application through the lived experiences of our guests. Our, spe our first speaker is Danya Cabello, an Oakland-born athlete, artist, and educator who uses her tools as a pedagogue and a physical mover to explore questions of freedom with and through the body. She played professional soccer with Santos FC of Brazil, Division I Ball at UC Berkeley, and is a founding member of Oakland Street Stylers Freestyle Soccer. She has traveled the world critically engaging students, families, and organizations on the possibility of play as a practice and site of healing. Welcome, Danya. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, I'm Danya. I will just share a random fun fact about myself. 
is when I'm not uh, playing soccer or thinking about soccer, uh, I, I am a self-appointed expert, expert in quotations, um, of the history of parks and recreation departments in the U.S. I find that history pretty fascinating um, and is actually the foundation of a lot of the ways that we think uh, and participate in sports today. So that's my random fun fact. I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Claire, for that introduction. Good. Thank you, Tanya, so much. Our next speaker is Christina Rodriguez, who is an alum of CSU East Bay's kinesiology department and who has been a governing board member for East Bay Center for Sport and Social Justice since 2000. Christina graduated in 2021, earning the department's award for the most outstanding undergraduate student that year, as well as being East Bay's nominee for the American Kinesiology Association's Outstanding Undergraduate Student Award. She grew up playing competitive soccer in the Bay Area and currently works with Soccer Without Borders in Oakland. She is one of the assistant coaches for the girls soccer team at Oakland International High School and Fremont High School. Importantly, as we already mentioned, she was also a member of our research team. Welcome, Christina. Hi everyone, thank you so much Claire for that introduction. Um, I'd like to share one fun fact about me is um, my goal next in life is to go to physical therapy school, hopefully applying this year and use the lens that um, I've been lucky to have access to and apply it to my future work. Good, thank you Christina. Our third guest speaker is Carl Cooper, who has over 33 years of experience in the operation of Parks and Recreation. His current position is Deputy Director for the Los Angeles County Department of Parks and Recreation, South County Community Services Agency. Carl also has core responsibilities for the department's sports division, including all sports programming countywide. He has had leadership roles with the department's gender equity program, Raise the Bar, Girls Play LA, the Gang Reduction and Youth Development Program, the Summer Nights Lights Program, and the Citywide Youth Sports Program for the City of Los Angeles. He has coached boys and girls basketball at a variety of levels as a volunteer for more than 25 years. Welcome, Carl. Thanks, Claire. Um, I appreciate uh, being a part of the panel and I uh, want to give a little fun fact about myself. Um, uh, I got an opportunity to play college basketball, have coached for years uh, at the college, high school level, and youth level. And uh, actually, that picture there is when I won a, a state championship on a staff in uh, 2012. But I think my most impactful, most fun coaching experience was coaching my eight-year-old daughter's youth basketball team, her first time ever playing. And it's really impactful because we went zero and 10. We lost every game. But I had every girl show up at every practice and every girl show up at every game. We had the best pizza parties and, and after game parties. And uh, my daughter and I still laugh about that today. So uh, thanks again for uh, having me here. Good, thank you, Carl. And thank you to all of our speakers. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. So now I'll pass the mic back to Kim, who's going to facilitate our discussion. Thank you so much, Claire, and thank you to our featured guests. Um, I'm so inspired by your background, by your collective years coaching and running your sports and being allies in this amazing quest for gender equity. So we want to turn now to our featured guests to ask them specifically of the tips, you know, which resonate with them, which are they using in their day-to-day -day work, in their day-to-day -day coaching. And I also want to acknowledge that we know the barriers to participation in sports, and physical activity are mighty for girls across the country. And that especially amongst girls in low-income communities, girls of color in low-income communities, it is really hard to get and stay in the game. Yet there's lots of low-hanging fruit that we can grab and apply to make sure that these girls can participate and really enjoy sports play. And I love Carl's point about you know, just quickly to mention, um, and this is something that the Lit Review highlights, is that girls often want to try their best and have fun in sports based on the research. The literature review shows that. So it's really not always about or ever about a win-loss record. It's about connecting with your coach and your teammates and setting new goals for yourself. So we want every kid, regardless of gender, race, socioeconomics, to have that opportunity. So now I want to turn over to Danya uh, to talk a little bit about the tips and which of the tips worked well in your experience and why did it work well? And we're excited that each of our featured guests have chosen to, to grab two to talk a little bit about today. So if we go to the next slide, um, John is gonna share with 
us a little bit about training all coaches how to coach girls and designing culturally responsive programming in her work. So over to you, Danya. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kim. Uh, and thank you to the research team for putting all of these uh, together so succinctly. It was kind of hard to choose just two. Um, but the two that I've chosen to speak about today, the first is tip number six, which is train all coaches how to coach girls. And tip number eight, designing culturally responsive programs, which the big picture for me has to do around education. And so these two tips, I feel, um, have a lot of overlap between them. Um, but first, I just want to say that in thinking about training all, girl, uh, all coaches on how to train girls, it's pretty fantastic to everybody who's in this panel right now um, who has come to get some new knowledge or to uh, participate in this way because sports is still a space where in schools, in organizations, it's kind of relegated to the toy department of human affairs. And I think it's fair to, to say that most of us who are here today know that it can be an incredible and meaningful and powerful tool. Uh, and so the first is just, a, you know, I, I want to start with this story of when I first started working in Oakland Unified uh, coaching soccer almost 20 years ago now, uh, I thought I made an assumption that because I was a coach and I was a woman and I was a Latina and I was from Oakland, that when I put the call out to start a soccer club, that the girls were just going to flock to my program. And a few weeks in, the numbers completely started to dwindle and I had a very male dominant program. Um, and a lot of that had to do with the fact that I was coming in with some assumptions that I think coaches, as coaches sometimes we hold, is that if we've reached the level of we've played our whole lives and then we become the coach, that somehow we become the expert in that space. And that there's no more learning that necessarily needs to be done because we've mastered the sport. Um, and this was a time of, I had to kind of reflect on my own practices as, a, as an educator and as a coach and realize that I was missing some information because I was missing an entire population in the school community in Oakland I was working at. And it took me onto this journey of becoming critical of the way that I was actually brought up in sport, which was you just jump on a field and you throw a ball out there and then you should just be expected to play without recognizing that be it girls or other students who for different reasons, um, you know, by the time they were reaching me in high school, not everybody had the same access to sport as some of their you know, male counterparts. And so the mere fact that we were putting, I was putting them in a, in a game that was inviting them to be physical. And I was realizing, oh, I had to learn at some point how to use my own body to physically engage in this game beyond just kicking the ball or passing it away. And so I started looking much more deeply at, oh, I'm missing this entire step because we're not always taught in soccer, like actually how to use our physical body. It's a lot about dribbling the ball and kicking it, but then you add on this other le level of complexity, which is that there's other human bodies that are coming at me. Um, and so I shared this anecdote because it took me down this very self-reflective journey of, I need to continue learning about how we are learning how we learn as humans with our body, that our sites are, our bodies are sites of knowledge production. We produce knowledge with our body. Um, and sometimes it needs to be scaffolded in a particular way to be more inclusive and accessible to somebody who doesn't have that background. Um, so it's a, when I say, you know, in terms of training all coaches, how to train girls, there is a level of you need to kind of consider, it's helpful when we consider ourselves lifelong learners, um, where maybe we've learned something, but we need to relearn or reconsider how we're doing something. And that pushes me into tip number eight, which is in thinking about designing culturally responsive programs, 
um, sometimes it's dangerous when we are, when we as coaches think that we must be the expert in everything or anything really. Uh, and, um, you know, I think about a case one time when I was designing a program for my athletes that were mostly Latino students in East Oakland, you know, first or second generation uh, immigrant families. And we were doing a hybrid program inviting young soccer players from Soccer Without Borders, who uh, were mostly recent arrived, uh, students that had recently arrived to this country uh, who spoke a multitude of languages. And one of the errors on my part was that I didn't ask. I, I designed a whole workshop that in many ways was inaccessible and incomprehensible to our invited guests. And that was a really big learning moment for me. That was about 12 years, 10 or 12 years ago. And I realized I didn't ask questions to my partner organization of what is needed uh, in a workshop of this nature to make it accessible and relevant to the lives of your students. And so this takes me down, back to this idea of um, inquiry, asking questions. One of the best ways to design culturally responsive programs is by asking questions that are what I call generative, that will generate a response that allows us to implement a new practice, um, a new system versus a, an extractive question. So an example is like, what's wrong with you today? That can be an extractive question that just you, you get the response of like, I don't feel good. And then what do you do with that versus I've noticed that you, you have you know, lower energy today. What might help you be more present today at practice? Um, so this idea of asking questions and you know, having five to 10 questions that you ask that will help you generate and design a program um, that relieves you from having to be the expert of your students' lives or your young athletes' lives. Um, so a lot of this goes back to just what are the questions that we are asking both of ourselves and of the people that we get to work with. Um, I hope that that was helpful. Uh, Absolutely, thank Dania, thank you. I mean, we're all leaning in and wanting to just really savor every word. And your experience is huge. And I love that notion of learning and relearning and really kind of checking our presumptions as we approach girls in sport, as our you know, coaching continues with kids and girls. And also I really love this point that we need to you know, mix the tips effectively because I think what you're talking about with culturally responsive programming, working with say immigrant youth, um, you're also asking girls what they want and what they need you know, with those uh, generative questions. So there's lots of ways we can be connecting with girls on teams or when we design program, uh, to make sure that we're meeting them where they're at in a way that works for them and we're not necessarily projecting what we ourselves learned or how we play growing up or you know what we think that they need so thank you Danya those are really great tips and way, ways to bring to life the lit review in real practice so now we want to turn and we'll you know have plenty of time for Q&A both in the chat so feel free to be putting questions in the chat or in the Q&A section um, as well as we'll have a chance to talk to our featured guests in a moment uh, with your follow-ups, but we're going to now go to Christina on her tips to highlight, uh, which are number four, emphasizing social support, as well as tip five, supporting women coaches. So Christina, can you share with us a little bit about your work and how you've used the tip to emphasize social support to get and keep girls in the game? Yeah, of course. Thank you, Kim. And thank you everyone for having me here and being a part of this conversation with us here Today, um, I feel really lucky to not be only part of the research group, but also the panelists group and being able to share my points of view and my experiences. And when being asked to be a panelist and being asked which two tips stood out to me, I think like Dania shared, it was pretty hard because they all intertwine with everything that we do in our everyday work. And I work with a nonprofit here in Oakland, California called Soccer Without Borders. And we use soccer as a vehicle for positive change, um, providing underserved youth with a toolkit to overcome obstacles to growth, inclusion, and personal success. And 
you know, when thinking about these two tips, the first one that came to mind for me was tip number four, emphasize social support from family and friends. And I didn't really think much of this because I am Mexican American. I grew up playing competitive soccer out in the Bay Area and my parents, my family members, my grandparents were either at every practice with me. I was getting driven by some family member always and stayed there till the end. And my games, I could hear them every moment. I could hear them. That pressure was high for me all the time. And uh, when I came to Talk Without Borders and I was invited to uh, be assistant coach for the high school's uh, soccer team here in Oakland International High School, um, I was anticipating the same thing. I didn't, I, for me, it was still a gray area. I was like, oh, you know, I grew up playing pay to play sports. And so to me, it's like, yeah, your parents are going to be there because they're investing money into this. They have to be there. And that was my whole lens. Um, and when we, when I joined this organization, I saw how different and far away from what I grew up knowing what sports was, was from this. And I remember we had the majority of the girls during that time were, and right now as well for some, uh, one of our other teams are Latinx girls. Um, we also have refugees and Asali girls. And, you know, it was, it was a new lens to look at. And I didn't know why their parents weren't coming sometimes. They didn't understand why their parents, why these girls had to take an hour bus ride to come for literally sometimes 30 minutes. And I didn't understand. And to me, I was hungry to find out like, what, what can we do to in, have them invested, whether that be for one game or a practice. And as I got more time to spend in this organization, I noticed how my other coworker, Maddie, who's amazing, um, would do simple high and buys sometimes to parents, right? And you think those don't go a long way, but she was persistent every time she saw them. And I started to do the same. And for our Latinx girls, I was able to, you know, carry on that conversation. I do speak Spanish. I was able to uh, have those cultural connections with them. And I was like, oh, hi, like your daughter's doing great. Or I would call sometimes to explain the program. And I didn't care if they'd asked me five times each time they called me, I would go ahead and explain it to them. And I would, and I continue to do it. And I continue to call their parents all the time. Like, Hey, your daughter's here at practice today with us. Like no worries. Or yeah, we have practice Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Like, don't worry about it. She's here with us. And it's a persistent thing that has continued and continues to happen. And I started to see the difference, especially when we started our global goal five league, which is um, specifically an in-house league for our, our girls here. And when we started calling them and explaining to their parents, like every Saturday, there is a game. Every Saturday, there's a game. We'd call them all the time, each weekend. And we started actually seeing parents come to their games. Like the crowd was getting bigger. And for us, like each season, we were on our third, our fourth season now. And the crowd just gets bigger each time. And to see how impactful saying hi by explaining the program more than once, even though they already know what it is, every time they ask me, I will go ahead and do it for them. Like it goes a long way. And I want to like retouch on that. The persistence of just like a simple high and buy starts that whole domino effect for, for connecting and building those bridges, whether that be with a guardian, their parents, a cousin, a sibling. And that only influences us to, you know, connect with their parents. And that, again, like I said, it impacts our girls because they want to bring their siblings. They want to bring friends. They want to bring their cousins. And that only allows us to grow our programming, which is always exciting when they bring a friend because they're like, oh, miss, like I brought my friend. She's never played before, but can she come? Like, of course, she's always welcome in the space. Anybody that you want to bring is always welcome in the space. And, you know, for me, that that being able to do that and see that impact has been amazing and just remembering how important it is to connect with their families, their friends, because that allows us to retain retention of girls in sports. And I'm sure, I'm sure this can be translated in other, in other sports, in other organizations, in other locations, because like I said, a simple high and buy once, that's great, but it doesn't, it doesn't change it. Persistence in this situation is extremely key because they remember your face. They, they're knowing they're seeing that you care and that you're creating a space for their daughters. And it's exciting because I'm sure in a lot of their countries, that's not what's created, nor are they invited to be in these spaces. And for me, that has played a big role in allowing me to connect with my players and their families or their friends and just being able to see them Wednesdays and Fridays all the time is super exciting. Even if it's for 30 minutes, sometimes because they're rushing from school or work, it's always exciting to see them.
Thank you, Christina. Those are great examples of tips. I have to admit, even in talking with Christina in recent years about this, I have adopted this in my own coaching practice where you realize that a wave to a parent or guardian that took three buses to pick up their daughter to make that practice possible, a wave and a thanks to them and a reminder to come back that next week is huge. So thank you for bringing that to life, Christina. And now, can you share with us a little bit about supporting women coaches and how you've seen that support for yourself as a coach and you do that for others and you see that in program? Yeah, um, again, this supporting women coaches to me was, I grew up having male coaches and I didn't think of it much growing up, I guess, just because, you know, you want to be the best at whatever sport you're playing and you will do whatever it takes. And that was my mindset at the time. And I, I didn't think much of it. And I, I guess I also didn't think much of it because growing up, my ideal like athlete was some a white woman. And those were goals that I was trying to attain that I, as I got older, I was like, wow, that I can't achieve that. I'm way disconnected from that. And so I never saw myself in leadership roles in any way, shape or form. I think Growing up, as I saw that, I was like, oh, that's really heartbreaking because I don't know how many other kids are seeing that and feeling the same way as me. And when I was able to work with Talk Without Borders, being a woman of color in this space was, it was scary for me because I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know what I was taking on. Um, I didn't know what my impact would be. I didn't know if I was going to take on that role, how I thought I was supposed to. And when being in the space, when I say I was invited into the space, it felt really good. It felt really good to be like, no, like you got this, like you can do it. You're more than capable of doing this. And it was still scary. Um, and when I saw the girls that I was working with, it was, it was so many different girls from so many different backgrounds. And I think that scared me a little bit more because I didn't grow up with that either. I'm like, oh, how do I, how do I lead in this space for them? Like, are they looking at me because I am a woman of color? And, uh, you know, I was, there was two other female coaches with me at the time. Um, our program has only grown more with our female staff, which is amazing and extremely exciting. Um, but at the time, again, I was still really scared. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know how I would lead in that space. And within my four years at working with Soccer Without Borders um, and the support of my coworkers, um, I feel a lot more confident in the space that I'm taking. In the, I feel more confident um, being a leader and being an example for my girls. and wanting to be their example and something that has shown me that I've I feel like the way that I've taken on this role has been successful is when I heard one of my participants players come up to me she said miss how do I become a coach like you coach Nay, and coach Maddie and I said what do you mean she's like well I want to be a coach and I don't want to go to college I know college is good and it'll be great for me I'm not saying it's a bad thing but I really want to be a soccer coach like you and her words were extremely impactful to me because throughout those four years, I didn't, I almost like imposter syndrome. You're like, wait, what have I been doing right to lead, to want her feel this motivated and take on a leadership role that I never was pushed to take on. And I saw that how much representation matters in those spaces and, you know, and how much taking up space in these spaces that are often dominated by men really are impactful to our girls. Our girls programming has grown so much. A, um, another thing that's happened, we've been able to see our girls take on leadership roles, whether that be wanting to coach our middle school girls team, um, refereeing on our weekend games for middle school girls and our high school girls teams. And we currently have some of our high school girls teams coaching in our elementary school league. And it's, it's beautiful to see that because we are supporting them to take on these roles and they're doing it. They come up to us and they say, yeah, I'm interested in doing it. And, you know, as an adult and getting that support, it feels great, but I'm sure as a, as a young girl, that must feel even more great because you're like, oh, wow, if I can conquer this, what more can I do in the future? And to me, that's why it's so important to support women coaches because we're leading as an example and we're just creating paths of success and opportunities that for a lot of the girls that I work with have been told, no, you shouldn't be taking on that role or no, that door is gonna be completely shut in your face. And to have that opportunity to be like, oh my gosh, like, yes, I can do this. I can go be a coach. Even if it's for one day, I feel good and confident to do it. And it's, 
I think that's the beautiful part about it and why something that we think doesn't, it might be something minor, but it does go a long way. And supporting Absolutely. women coaches definitely is a long-term thing that should continue, that should be a continuous thing. Because again, like I said, it creates opportunities for girls who might be feeling the same way that I did when I was younger and be like, oh, wait, I can do this. Like I'm more than capable of becoming I love this. It. So many hashtags. Oh, wait, I can do this. You know, count her in girl leaders, girl coaches, women leaders, women uh, coaches. Like, thank you, Christina. I, we could do a whole session on your incredible program and your incredible coaching with Soccer Without Borders that has really pioneered a lot of great practices around the space. So thank you so much. Um, all right. We are just flying by with time. We wish we had even more time and we can't wait for the next session on this in the future. I'm now going to pivot. Um, and I just want to also thank Christina for again, blending the tips together, talking about how, you know, having accessible opportunities, having culturally responsive opportunities mixes with supporting women coaches, for example. So thank you for that, Christina. So now we're going to talk with Carl Cooper. Uh, who's down in Southern California and really pioneering again on supporting girls in sport. So if you could share with us how you feel that tip five, supporting women coaches as a male ally uh, is part of your regular practice and your, your department practice. And then tip one, promoting girl only and girl uh, centered programming. Thanks, Carl. Thanks, thanks again, Kim. And um, I'll try to be succinct so we can get some questions at the end of this. But, um, you know, I've done this for, for uh, over 30 years working in the kind of parks and recreation community based type of programs. And, and I've got to do it from, you know, girls in the entry level to I've got to coach and volunteer for over 25 years at the kind of uh, rec level, AU level, high school level, and even working with uh, college students. Um, so I've seen it from all sides. I have, uh, I have a young man and I have a I have a daughter and a son, so I've got to see it from a parent standpoint too. But, you know, looking at this from like a parks and recreation or community-based organization field, I'm gonna talk a little bit about women coaches and supporting and, and girls only activities. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, really important that we continue to support female coaches leading sports programming. Um, it's important that there are faced they help us to recruit, they help us to get out. They are our voices, our word of mouth uh, when they're coaching uh, to our communities, to our parents. In some of our communities, you know, it's through word of mouth how parents feel comfortable coming out and being parts of our programs. And the more women uh, that we have coaching that look like the girls that are playing, it helps us in those communities. Um, you know, in our high need communities, you know, there are issues, there are issues. In some of our more affluent communities, you know, getting girls out to play are not as, as difficult because parents like myself and my wife may have played sports. We get our girls out and it happens a lot easier. But in the high meat communities, for a number of reasons, girls are not allowed always to think about sports as something they should do or could do. And it's for a number of reasons. They may have other responsibilities in the household. They may have to babysit siblings. They may have to help a single parent with, you know, with uh, household duties, cooking or cleaning. And, and, and that factor too of not having money in the household. And we know it shouldn't happen, but we know when there's not much money in the household, sometimes parents will find a way for the male siblings to play sports and maybe the, the females won't get that opportunity. That definitely should not happen. Um, you know, women coaches understand the challenges girls have in playing sports. Like I said before, they can be your conduit. They can be that, that vocal marketing tool for you with community groups, outreach. And just like Christina said, talking to parents or talking to folks uh, when they're out there, making them feel comfortable and understanding this may be different than co-ed sports or what have you. It's about making the girls feel comfortable in their skin and comfortable in the environment they're in out um, as, they're, as they're trying to play and enjoy sports. So for our African-American girls and Latinx girls, it's additionally impactful to have coaches with ra uh, racial and ethnic identities uh, that help them to connect uh, you know, out there. That is a huge plus for us in communities that may not always just push our girls out to play but in our African-American and Latinx communities, this happens. Um, you know, we need, you know, girls need female coaches who can direct, uh, can directly connect with them, understand their experiences, encourage her to persevere and get them back. It's about getting them out to enjoy the sport, but it's also about getting them back. You know, all too often we know when girls hit a certain age, 
they, they, they kind of drop off uh, the lens of girls sports and sports in general. And we want to keep them coming back. We want to make sure they're cycling through to ultimately get into the place where they're out there coaching also. You know, it's important for girls to see and understand women, uh, see them in these coaching roles so that they know they can come back and aspire to be coaches someday. And I kind of look at it as that full circle where we bring our young ladies in to play when they're eight, nine, and 10. They learn the sports, they love the sports, they go to high school and play, maybe even to college play, and then they come back. And those are your coaches that most impact the program or, or most impact those communities because they come back and they're a part of this. And, and man, you know, as much as I could say it and do it, if I have a female coach or even a female mentor or one of my staff members, it's so much more impactful. Um, you know, women coaches are role models for these young ladies, and we have to celebrate that. And that's how it's celebrated. Um, you know, we got to see and we have to see more uh, female coaches because then a young lady will see this as a, a, a legitimate, viable uh, something for her to expire to later in life. And, you know, what I was told and what I've been told in talks and what we do in recreation that is, you know, girls coached by women are more likely to stay in and to be in coaching women and girls later in, in sports. So, you know, it's not anything that we haven't talked about with our other two panelists, but it's about inspiring, pushing. And when we get, you know, female coaches that look like the girls that are playing, it's, it's gonna help our programs. And I've seen that over the 25 years working in recreation. I mean, I could do it to a certain level, but when I have a Kim you out there that's coaching, it's extremely more impactful. So transitioning into what I feel is really the most important part of this is, is promoting girls only programming. I mean, for, for um, especially you park administrators that are just getting into this, the most important part of this is offering those girls only activities. Um, extremely important is that girls get their own space to play. You know, please, but, but please understand this, you have to be patient. You have to be patient. If you're lucky enough to be in a community where you offer girls only programming for the first time and it fills up or you get too many you have waiting lists or you, you have to add additional responsibilities or classes for this, awesome. But it doesn't always happen that way. And you can't give up, you can't stop. This is not, you know, only got four girls, so we're not gonna offer this in the future. Those four girls this time, if you do it the right way, will be eight girls. Those eight girls will be 16 and it grows. But it's, it's about being patient it's about looking about looking at how you're you're really launching this, how you're marketing, who are the groups you're talking to, and where you're going with it. You have to continue to be persistent in doing it, and offer good programming, and offer good opportunities, and make it fun. And the girls will come. You know, girls play and enjoy sports for different reasons than boys. You got to understand that from the beginning. And what you have to be is equitable in how you offer these programs. It doesn't, if you don't offer the co-ed programming in prime time on a Saturday morning and then the girls get pushed to Sunday afternoon. You can't, it's equitable. If you offer, uh, in, in, in one term, if you offer the co-ed sport at this time, you also offer the girls sports at that time. And that's some of the key things you got to start with. But I wanna give you a few tips, a few tips of things that can be done that's been tested. Um, just some, you know, girls only program activities to start with, and some of them are pretty simple, but if you do them right, they help, they help really pushing your programs forward. The one thing we did, and this goes back to my days in the city of Los Angeles, um, we mandated that we had girls only gym time. You know, you find a facility, it could be a different amenity for us, it was gyms, we had tons of gyms through the city of Los Angeles, girls only gym time, we had specifically one day a week, and you offer it. Now, different things happen, you're going to have some levels that you're gonna get a few girls that come out. You may have to have somebody facilitate clinics or skills development for them to have fun. I've had where I've had former um, uh, female coaches, high school coaches that work in, in rec supervisor roles that offer this. And they got junior high and high school girls to come out for a place to have open run that eventually after a period of time end up being high school and college girls coming out for open run certain times. And then you even got some professional females that would come out and play because they knew this was happening but there's different levels of it. And it's okay at any of those levels if you're offering it and you're giving girls the opportunity to have their own time. You can do this with sports clinics. You could do it with non-traditional games. You could do it with just fitness clinics. I mean, you could have girls across clinics. Uh, wrestling is huge now. We're starting wrestling programs and other things in parts of uh, Southern California. But you find something that they wanna do. You find something to do it at their own time for their own place and then you do it. Now, one of mine that I love 
that's it's easy, but it's it takes time, it takes staffing. Is you know, girls only field trips. I mean, you take a group of girls to your local high school to see a basketball, you know, softball or soccer game, or you take them to colleges, it's your junior colleges or your high or your major colleges in your communities. And what you do is not only do you give them the ability to see uh, female athletes doing this at a very high level, but you connect it to the education port at your junior college and your colleges. And, and those college programs, if you call the coaches or call the athletic department, they would love to have you guys out with your girls uh, coming to the game. So that's an easy one. What we're doing in the county this year for the first time, um, we're doing girls sports day. Have a girls sports day. You know, we're, we're trying to get 500 girls at one of our rec facilities, and we're going to have a day full of clinics and activities. We're going to have a day full of uh, inspirational speakers, keynote speakers. We're going to do food and we're going to have some fun. Um, but we're going to do this, um, you know, the first time for us, the city of LA, we did this every year. We've done it every year. They, they still do it. And it's something that you can do depending on your uh, where you work and, and, and what you guys have in the way of resources, you could do it with 100 girls, you could do it with 50 girls, or you could do it with 1000 girls. So you look at these as uh, things to get you into the girls only programming, you have to make sure that you celebrate women in sports and girls in sports, you celebrate Title IX, you celebrate women and girls uh, sports week, and then you make it and give yourself girls friendly environment. You, you, in your facilities, you have display sports where you put posters up on girls sports. You uh, put articles of local girls sports. You applaud, uh, uh, um, you applaud women in sports and what they're doing. And you change it every you know, month or every quarter. You know, there's so many things you can do that, that take a little bit of effort and you can be done with, with not a ton of resources, but it's getting it out, promoting it, having girls only and really, you know, really figuring out where you're launching and where you're pushing, but you have to be patient and you have to, you know, have those female athletes, those female coaches and those female staff members that really push it for you. I can go on oh for hours. Goodness. Things, but <laughs> I, I we could listen. We could listen to our future guests all day. Thank you, Carl. Amazing tips. I hope everyone took a lot of notes. We are sending out this recording, of course, afterward and these tips, and we're getting so many great questions. And I think we're going to just remind the audience that some of these questions we're going to answer one-to-one uh, -one after the panel or through a follow-up email. So really good dialogue going on. We want to make sure people have these tools so you have QR codes. And these tools actually answer a lot of the questions in the chat, like how do I approach girls in an effective manner as a coach, you know, or what do I do uh, to get more women coaches in program? So do, do folks please like check out these three tools and then consider which of these tips that we've highlighted do you want to feature in the future uh, in your program, whether it be third party youth sports club, park and rec, K-12, even pre-K, because we want to get girls in the game early on. Um, I do want to highlight additional tools Soccer Without Borders has a lot of good stuff on their website. Cal State East Bay has this amazing Making Moves podcast, uh, which does a lot on gender equity and sport. St. Mary's has things like the Graduate Kinesiology Colloquium, or you can go watch their amazing sports teams with your girls. Um, and then I want to flag more allies like U.S. Soccer Foundation, Women's Sports Foundation, We Coach and Tucker. I can't believe we're one minute to wrap. <laughs> so we're just going to flag Missy. It's going to bring us home Great. and uh, we'll send follow up uh, after this wonderful session. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, thank you, everyone. We have like 30 seconds to, to finish up here. So with that being said, we want to thank everyone for their time. We are going to be following up with an email that will also have the recording and recording not just for you, but please share it widely. That's the purpose of this. We would also love feedback, too, if you even want to leave it in the chat or in response to an email. What other webinars would you like to see that are related to this content? How can we help out? How can we keep these conversations going? So again, reminder, we will answer those questions, all those excellent questions in the chat. Keep them coming coming for a little bit, we will answer them uh, to the best of our ability as a group. And we just appreciate everyone showing up here on a Thursday afternoon. Thank you to our panelists too. You are outstanding. Take care, everyone. Have a good rest of your Thursday. Appreciate your time.